Okay, so um, if everybody could grab a seat and we'll get started in like 10 more seconds. Great. Well, first off, a huge thank you to Notion for hosting. They've been incredibly gracious to us in terms of having us in here um, for the last few talks. So uh, thanks again for um, Notion, amazing company. If you're recruiting, go join them. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the real purposes of the events are sort of twofold. One is to continue to sort of build community in San Francisco and the Bay Area. You know, AI has really been emerging as a very exciting sort of next gen area that I think will transform a lot of what's happening in startups and society and everything else. Um, and then second, just to have conversations on really interesting topics and kind of benefit from those conversations. Uh, we'll have about an hour talk. Um, we'll open uh, up for a few questions at the very end from the audience. And then um, unfortunately, Reed has to leave right after, but people are welcome to stick around for another hour to network and hang out and meet each other. And then you'll get booted out at around eight. So as a warning, <laughs> um, that's when you'll be asked to leave. Um, so first off, it's a huge pleasure to have Reed here. Um, he's done, I think, almost everything in Silicon Valley over the course of his career. Uh, he's co-founder of LinkedIn. Um, he's a legendary investor at Greylock. Um, he was uh, first angel check-in at Facebook. He funded Airbnb. Um, he's on the board of Microsoft, on the board of OpenAI. He's one of the very early proponents and funders of OpenAI. Um, I remember actually, um, I think it was five, six, seven years ago, um, Reed actually invited me to a small event that he hosted on AI and its implications to technology and society. And so he's been thinking about this area for a very long time. And I think it's sort of one of the pioneers in terms of thinking about it very deeply. And um, so I think he's roughly done everything. I sometimes imagine, oh, and he's also starting a new company called Inflection, which is an AI company. So he's basically done everything. I, I imagine Reed sometimes on like Christmas Eve, getting into like a Santa outfit and flying into the air and distributing toys and stock certificates to children around the world or something. You know, he's truly, yeah, exactly. He's truly done everything over time. Um, so first off, thanks so much for joining us today um, and for participating. Great pleasure. And you missed out on investing in Mixer Labs too, but yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. So read back to, uh, my now obscure first startup. So um, thanks for doing that. <laughs> and that was a while ago. Um, so uh, first off, I'd just love to hear more about how you got interested in AI. Um, when did you first get involved and interested in this area? And what are some of the ways that you participated in the industry over time? Um, so part of the, the funny thing is, so uh, my major, a bunch of you probably uh, know this if you went through Stanford, I was the eighth person to declare symbolic systems at Stanford. So the kind of artificial intelligence, the thinking about, you know, what is, what are thinking beings? What is cognition? What is language? Uh, how do we learn? Uh, how do we discover truth has been something that has been uh, my interest for a long time. And then I concluded that we were a long ways off, um, got a little bit like maybe you should uh, study philosophy for thinking, decided philosophers didn't understand thought that much better than anyone else. Uh, and so then, you know, went into entrepreneurship. And then, um, you know, part of um, what was happening is people started talking to me about, oh, there's this resurgence in AI coming. I was like, oh yeah, I know about that. Like, no, 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 you don't. Um, and, and so I got persuaded to go and start talking to, you know, a set of the, the folks who were doing major things like DeepMind is part of how inflection kind of came about and very quickly saw, okay, this is going to be, um, th this wave is coming. Um, and obviously this year it's that, that, that wave is going to be, be picking up size. So a lot of people are going to be seeing it, but you know, part of what we're seeing here is actually in fact, the result of the fact that one of the major waves is coming a scale compute. And when you look at the various kinds of things that are under, that are described under AI, they're all kind of versions of how do you apply scale compute in a way that, you know, you get this performance function with one exaflop, what performance function do you get with two exaflops? And if that's going up and you can go, the, go for a, or a while with that, then you've got, you know, kind of some very interesting new kinds of capabilities and new things. And, you know, the whole discussion about, you know, is it a tool or is it a, a creature and so forth is all very interesting to do. But like right now, that's like the main line we're seeing because like the self-play stuff that AlphaZero was doing isn't so much like AI as much as it's a, a it's a, a different way of defining a fitness function. And I think we're going to see a whole bunch of those. And so, that's the thing that got me back into it. When I started back when we did that salon, I wasn't really sure there was there were going to be uh, startup opportunities. Now I'm obviously very convinced there's a bunch of startup opportunities, 
you know, it was like, well, is it only going to be massive scale compute that's only going to be available to a few? You know, what's what's the things that are going to play out in this and all of that? And and so my initial focus was kind of the question of, well, how do you shape it for the benefit of humanity? What are the social implications? What are the ways that um, this uh, uh, you know, IP and intelligence can be shared across the different efforts without doing any bad market effects or any other you know kinds of things as ways of doing that. And then as I got close to it, I said, oh, actually, in fact, there's so much, the wave's going to be so big. There's just no way that even the, 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 the large uh, compute players are going to be able to do even a, 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 a more than a small fraction of this. And that gives a ton of uh, room for startups. That gives a ton of room for even, you know, uh, the uh, all uh, tech companies doing something. Uh, and so then about probably about four years ago or five years ago, it's probably around when helping uh, Sam and Elon with OpenAI um, that I got, um, you know, much more intense on this. And then could you tell us a little bit more about Inflection? So I think this is the first company you've started or co-founded since LinkedIn. And so how did it come about that you started a company again? Like usually as, as somebody who started two companies, it's so painful that doing another one, you know, I always be with dread, but also, um, you know, how to get going, who you're working with, and what can you tell us about it today? And I think it's in stealth, so I don't know how much you can tell us, but I'm, I'm super intrigued. Um, yeah, well, so that that's definitely the, eventually you forget how hard it is and and you get this little euphoria and you jump into it again. Because, uh, you know, I started a company, Social Net, started LinkedIn, uh, part of the founding team of PayPal. I mean, it just, it's like, oh, I'm jumping into this again. Um, so part of it is I had been, uh, kind of thinking about like, okay, what are, what, where are there going to be roles for, um, you know, companies and the applications are going to be building their own large models? Where are going to be roles for other companies? How is, like, what a, in this, this very murky future, because it's all going to be uh, changing very fast, uh, landscape, market, compute, competition, talent, available uh, things, like it's like all these complex variables moving around. So it's very hard to, to see what the interesting fixed points are that you can build companies around or build longer stage projects around, but you tr started trying to do that. And so as doing that, I was talking to, you know, a number of different folks. I mean, um, uh, Mustafa, um, who, you know, from DeepMind and, and Brain had a, you know, obviously, you know, a driver's seat and some of the stuff and what are the kind of opportunities and what to do and, and I can't say a lot about inflection because we haven't been uh, been public about it yet. And so I was kind of okay. Look, I'll 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 be chair of your board and I'll invest. And we were working out product and working on product stuff and working go to market stuff and all the rest. And he said, "Well, I'd like you to co-found this with me." And I was like, uh, "You know, I do have a day job, right?" <laughs> and he's like, "No, no, no, like like a day a week, right? Like that, like that's what I want to, you know to be doing." I was like, "Oh, yeah, I'll do that." Uh, and it's part because for the same reason all of you are here. Um, the impact of AI across every industry and across society can be just stunningly magnificent. There are challenges we need to work out as well. But, you know, one of the things that frustrates me about the general dialogue around this stuff is, is they go, well, this, you know, ChatGPT has a problem with factuality. You're like, okay, yep, right. But the stuff we need to do there, but look at all the other stuff it does. That's like, and like people say, well, it has hallucination problems. Like, okay. Well, hallucination problem is also, by the way, creativity superpowers. What can we do with those creativity superpowers? And so, uh, and 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 that sort of thing. And so, like you know, when Mustafa and I were working through that and thinking about well, like what are the things to do, we think we have still a fairly unique, interesting approach that will you know be coming out before too long. Um, and then I look forward to being able to talk about it more. That sounds great. It sounds super intriguing. And I think you all, are you all hiring right now or no? Uh, they are hiring. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, so I guess there's a related question, which is where does value in the industry aggregate? And a lot of people are wondering what proportion of the successes in the industry go to the platforms uh, like OpenAI or other APIs, um, what goes to the application layer? And so it'd, it'd be interesting to hear your viewpoint in terms of like, what does this ecosystem look like in three to five years, both from the perspective of app versus platform, but also like what's the natural evolution path on the platform side? Um, well, one of the natural ways to look stupid in the future is to make really concrete predictions in the present. Um, so, you know, with that caveat and, and deep fear and hesitation. Uh, so I think 
that I think there's fundamentally kind of two trends uh, that are going on. One trend is um, on the scale compute thing, which includes large language models. I don't think that will be the only application of scale compute. I think the scale compute and size of compute will be driving one trend of progress. And part of that trend of progress is where does, for example, an extra 20% of performance matter? So if you think, well, okay, a virtual doctor, well, extra 20% really does matter, right? You know, maybe lawyer, maybe engineer, maybe, you know, and they go, okay. So on that large scale, like, okay, like, well, yes, we're innovating and we've, we've accomplished so much more with this smaller model. Well, what if you do that smaller model now at scale on the things that really matter where that cost curve of the, the large male being, the large model being uh, super expensive is worth that either directly to what the large model folks are doing or as provisioning to startups and so on. And then I think the other trend will be highly tuned, more compact scale compute, whether they're, you know, large language models, foundational models, other things. And maybe they'll be tuned with very specific data. Maybe they'll be tuned for a very specific thing within, you know, kind of an operational cost, you know, and I think you'll see progress and maybe some of those will be open sourced. I think we'll get into more of that later. Now, in terms of aggregation of where does, where is there interesting opportunities for building companies and where will the, uh, the kind of the projects turn into great companies in three to five years and how much of it will be, you know, the large language model or scale model providers and others. There's definitely a lot of uncertainty there. I'm pretty sure that there will be at least multiple uh, large model providers. Um, and I think that's good for the overall ecosystem in the industry. Um, and I think that they will also, in different ways, like open AI's real thing is beneficial AI is their top thing. And so they will, they don't have the thing to say, oh, come build on the open AI platform and then we're gonna go build that app. That they have like, like, negative interest in that, less than zero in doing that uh, kind of stuff. So that gives a lot of entrepreneurial freedom and ability to run an event, which is, I think is good, uh, plus the, the multiple. So I think that's good. And then I think the other area is to say, you know, like these, even like a 50 billion parameter, 100 billion parameter model or a one exaflop model, you know, kind of trained the right way, you know, um, you know, there'll be a bunch of these things that'll be open source, that'll be good for developers, good for creativity and so forth. But we are going to have to be careful of this stuff, right? Because, um, you know, like for example, I'm I I was skeptical about the early releases of stability because of, you know, uh, various forms of exploitive material or revenge porn or other kinds of things. You know, obviously misinformation within the ecosystem is one of the things we have to deal with, and and we'll have to take responsibility for those kind of open models in various ways when you get these kind of superpowers. And so I think it's one of the things that it's important to. Um, uh, important also to track, but I think you will have a huge amount of generativity. And then, um, then I think it actually is kind of like the old school rules. Like, well, does your business have network effects? If your business has network effects, then kind of like whatever you're provisioning in either of these two threats, that'll be good. If you're integrated to a lot of enterprises, that integration is another form of persistence in business. If you have, um, you know, you kind of get a first to scale and you're, in that first to scale, all of blitz scaling, you're doing the aggregation of customers, the brand, the aggregation of talent, the aggregation of, of um, uh, capital and all the rest, that could be it. And so all those are those, those old rules still apply here. Now, the question of course is given so much interest and so much going on, figuring out how to do them exactly, well, that's very challenging. Um, but that challenging means is ultimately to the advantage of startups because in places where you can run experiments and you can run them without worrying about damaging your current brand or position or customers is one thing. And you can run the experiments really quickly and change. Um, you can uh, try things um, in terms of, well, maybe there is a, maybe there's a big market here. Maybe there's not, I can try it. Um, cause I, you know, cause different startups can go after different things. You can respond quickly. You can say, well, we, we tried this for two months and now we're doing something entirely different, uh, which is one of the things that large companies can't do. Um, I mean, literally, I don't think there's any large company that can do that. Uh, and so anyway, so that's where I think part of it is looking at. Now, that being said, to, to finish out an answer to your question, um, I think that one of the things that uh, my partner, Sam Motometi at Greylock and I wrote in the fall, because like 100% certain of this, is that within five years, there will be equivalent of a 
co-pilot for every profession and define a profession as I process information and generate things that also have to do with information. Like a doctor generates prescriptions and diagnoses. And so like all of the graphic designers generate, you know, kind of graphic designs. And, and I think there will be something for everything. And five years, I think, is giving us generous time. Like, I think it will be sooner than that. And I think that is nearly certain. And that a range of impact and range of thing is part of why there is such amazing startup opportunity that even the current startups all going for it, look, they're going to pick some of them, not all of them. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it also seems like if you start thinking about the split between startup and incumbent value for those things, areas that don't have a clear incumbent are probably great startup opportunities and ones that do maybe more mixed. So like accounting software, maybe that's wide open while in medical, it's mixed depending on who plays. And regulation and all the rest. Regulation. Yeah, exactly. Um, I guess going back to the platform question, because different people have different views of what the platform world will look like. And by platforms, I mean, you know, foundation models and APIs like what OpenAI are doing. And one view of the world is effectively everything becomes Taiwan Semiconductor Corp, where there's one player who iterates through capital and process engineering and other things. You mentioned you think it's more likely to be at least an oligopoly market where there's multiple players competing. Um, and one of the arguments that's being made in the industry right now is that with each subsequent model, the capital and compute scale goes up dramatically. So if GPT-3, I'm making up a number is 10 or 20 million a few years ago to train, and then GPT-4 is I'm making up the number 100 million, and GPT-5 is half a billion, and GPT-6 is a billion, or equivalent models, um, A, do you believe that that's the future, at least for the foreseeable future? And B, does that effectively prevent new entrants at some point because the cost of entering is so high that eventually the market just consolidates into a few players. Um, I do think that there will be a, that that's part of the reason why in the large model it will be oligopoly. And as I know you think too, um, like along the lines of cloud compute, right? Which is there aren't gonna be that many end cloud computer, uh, compute providers because you just have to be doing a huge amount of real estate and power and, you know, kind of, uh, provisioning and all the rest of the stuff. And so there's going to be a limited end size of, of cloud compute. Well, that cloud compute will parallel. And part of the reason I'm optimistic about the oligopoly is because all of the cloud compute will have a, net, uh, a natural gravitas to saying, oh, I should be a provider here too. And so that's the reason why I tend to think it won't be only one, um, but it will be N. Uh, now, that being said, uh, capital, like the capital strain that you're going through, I don't think that capital is at all a problem. And for building new technology in the modern globalized network world, even with the anti-globalization trends, a billion dollars is really not that much money. That's not the issue. The issue really will be uh, a compute availability, uh, you know, um, intelligence and 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 integrity um, around, you know, kind of like handling it smart and safely around data and that kind of thing. Um, you know, questions around uh, the geopolitics and all the rest of that will be actually be the, the the things much more than the capital. So you mentioned that you think the cloud providers will have a natural sort of path into competing as platforms in this area. Could you extrapolate a little bit more in terms of what you think the role of various big tech will be in this industry? So um, the, the good news, I think, for society, for entrepreneurs, uh, for markets, is that I think it's very natural for like there's a set of players um, who are the giants in, in cloud compute now, and the market's somewhat divided across them. And, you know, there's a leader and there's there's chasers, but it's not, you know, the, the, there's, there's a heavy competition going on there already. There's new entrants trying to come and add into the pack. All of them, because when you get to what is, what is going to be consuming a lot of scale compute is obviously a bunch of you know, ML AI functions and, and, and you know, the, the, the engagement and the, the lens of seeing the future of chat GBT, which is the reason why probably everybody in this room knows that I, you know, released the podcast interviewing chat GBT already. Um, and uh, that already captures that imagination that uh, and sees all kinds of possibilities. Like, obviously, it has impacts on search. Uh, obviously, it has impacts on education. Um, Obviously, some people go, oh, this is terrible. We should stop it because it's having impacts on education. And always the answer to that is, how do we shape it so we can make education better? That's where the discourse should be. Um, and so, uh, and, and I'm going to do a podcast with ChatGPT sometime in the next week on that, <laughs> right? Uh, and so, uh, anyway, so uh, 
so I think the good news about that is that all of them go, well, this is going to be a huge demand of compute. So we all need to be providers here and we're all competing with each other. Then for entrepreneurs and competition in society, look, sure, uh, you know, product, you know, uh, cloud provider one might be the best, but cloud provider two and cloud provider three and cloud provider four will be there and they will be competing on price and offering and quality and so forth and doing it. And that's why I have a very high belief that a oligopoly around these things that is, you know, like we make oligopolies work. We have oligopolies in cell phone providers. We have, you know, a whole bunch of different things. Like, you know, we have oligopolies in tech platforms, you know, like we can make them work. What do you think? Um, so if you look at the semiconductor industry as an analog, in the 90s at least, each subsequent microprocessor that was released really merited an upgrade of your entire system, right? And so you, you had fabs that cost billions of dollars to make and they kept getting more and more expensive. And then with each generation of chip, um, everybody would switch over and then selling the prior generation of chip was a tenth the cost. It was much cheaper and you could use it in all sorts of other applications. And you could argue that in the LLM or foundation model world, something similar may happen where when GPT-6 equivalents for a billion dollars, GPT-4 is much cheaper. And you can train a model like that for a fraction of the cost and then suddenly it's accessible for everything. Do you think that's the path that open source will take or do you think open source foundation models will be roughly equivalent in the near future to the cutting edge models? No, actually, I think your first is, is, is the right thing. And that was what I mean, those two trails. There's the scale and then there's the other one. And I think the other one will include some open source and some not open source, safety, other kinds of things as parts of that. Um, you know, provision, protection of data, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then I think the 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 large one will be, uh, I don't think those will be open source for a number of different reasons. Um, uh, like, for example, it didn't surprise me that the image diffusion stuff was open source. Because if you look at it, it's like, okay, it's a one to two billion parameter model. It's, you know, it's like, it's just a question. Of, the only thing I didn't do when I wrote the essays around looking at how Dolly would affect the world work and how to think about this and so forth was I should have put in there a prediction of, oh, within a month there'll be open source models because it's, it's doable that way. Whereas when you're on these, this, these are super expensive, uh, very compute intensive, safety considerations are real, right? And so um, I think it's much less likely that the open source will play on that thread. Do you have any extrapolation of the rate? Just like with Moore's law, you have some eventual asymptote that's just guided by physical reality in terms of line widths on a chip. Is there like um, Reed's law or something, <laughs> the Hoffman's law of asymptotic? Um, well, uh, boy, I wish I had one. Um, that would be fun. Uh, and so what I would say is a little bit of the, what I think when you're, real thing you're looking at is measuring compute. And, uh, and it's a little bit less size of model these days. I think it's, it's more compute all of the chinchilla paper and other areas is kind of ways of looking at this. And, um, and I think that the, the, the fact is it doesn't even have to be linear increases with linear compute and limit, l linear performance. That was the reason I was gesturing at. Sometimes you say, okay, I had a 2X uh, increase in compute, but only a 20% increase in performance. But sometimes that increase in performance is hugely valuable, right? Like if you say, well, that's a 20% uh, increase in productivity for every programmer. Oh, well, that's worth the, <laughs> the, the 2X. To some, at some point, it becomes not worth it because to export, you know, like blah, and you get physical laws. Now, even Moore's law, which, you know, as a law was kind of like, well, this was a prediction of a network of innovation. Like to do Moore's law, they had to do lots and lots of different innovations. And I do think we will continue to see lots and lots of innovations. Like how do you get the density of compute sufficient that you can continue to do more scale models because already we've got, okay, power and cooling and network density and all of these other things. And we know that we're like, okay, whoa, you know, like, you know, when you get past to three nanometer chips, like, okay, two, you know, like, what are you doing exactly? Like, how does that all play on people then of course, gesture quantum and do a bunch of stuff. And maybe like there's a bunch of interesting stuff going on in quantum and for particular problems, very interesting. Um, but I think that the, Density of compute, I don't think we are near the asymptote for that um, because there's all these different parameters that you can invent that aren't just going down nanometers of chips in order to make it work. Um, and like, for example, I think, you know, everybody in this room probably knows like that network interconnect is one of the areas I think there's still a huge amount of upside in. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I guess that took um, 
AMD something like 30 years to catch up to in, Intel, just in terms of microprocessor generations. And so if there's something similar here where you can just keep iterating up a curve, it could last a very long time. So, um, and then, uh, you know, if you look at the players in big tech, and this will be my last big tech question, uh, uh, you know, Google obviously um, had the team that invented transformers, they have the data, they have the compute, they have the capital, they have the products, they have the human feedback. What role do you see them playing in the future of this market segment? And similarly, you know, what, what role do you think Facebook is likely to play? So let's see. Uh, Google um, obviously, you know, uh, did a whole bunch of the work that helped generate all this, which is, you know, great. Um, and, um, you know, they have some innovators dilemma around search stuff. They have uh, some worries around because there is, from general society, such a uh, starting place of skepticism. They are very worried about safety and dialogue and other things, and that causes them to adopt one path in doing this. Um, and that gives room for startups, which is great. Uh, and you know, I think that. Uh, but I do think that they are, you know, working hard and have, have a bunch of very smart people. They have scale compute infrastructure. I think we'll see uh, some interesting things out of them. I think Palm was interesting, um, you know, but, you know, they still haven't really uh, released Imogen uh, very much. Uh, and I think that there's, there's, there's stuff there. Um, so I think there's kind of this question about Google figuring out what its identity and balancing these things are. Because as probably a lot of people know, there's a lot of dialogue about, how to be responsible and, and, and Google is very, takes that very seriously. Um, and so, and then for Facebook, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, they obviously have the very early with creating fair, uh, you know, Jan LeCun, uh, super smart. One of the people I talked to when I started, when I started digging into AI at the very beginning. Um, and, you know, there's a bunch of the, the, the human feedback loops that fade back, that Facebook is a very natural place to. And, you know, while it's obviously very uh, fashionable to just be critical of Facebook, you know, when you have a billion DAO and a bunch of people using it, they use it for a lot of things they like. It doesn't mean I don't have criticism too. I've even gone on television and, and done that um, and then had a conversation with Mark about why I did that and, you know, so forth. And, um, uh, and I think that the, uh, and I think they will also then play a, a serious role here um, I think they will they will start kind of refocusing probably some from the metaverse stuff or including the stuff in the metaverse stuff because you know the thing is not just uh, recommendation engines for your newsfeed the thing is not just ads the thing is you know how how do these uh, technologies now help amplify human beings and what should be the role within a social network and 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 I you know I I would predict within you know a relatively short number of months. Facebook will start taking that more seriously. Yeah. One of the things you brought up in a, a few different instances, both in the context of Google as well as the open source is AI safety. And it seems like there's a variety of different definitions of safety, everything from alignment, you know, well, AI someday is subsumus. There's, um, you know, uh, bad content or bad outcomes that can occur through the use of AI. There's defense tech. And then there's um, almost like political orientation or discourse. What does AI safety mean to you? And what do you think is the right way to substantiate it? So um, it's too easy for a lot of people, including journalists, to go, oh, I'm doing AI safety. And what I'm essentially trying to do is say, until you're nearly perfect, you shouldn't release and you shouldn't be iterating. And that's a disastrous mistake on a lot of different fronts, on almost all the fronts, even one of the ones, some of the ones that are concerning, like, you know, potentially weapons and other kinds of things. And so you have to balance the, we have to get engaged and we have to learn. And what it means that you have to then index to where are the major harms and where are the minor harms? And by the way, we have minor harms, you know, all the time. Like, for example, we have 40,000 deaths per year in uh, car driving, right? And it's like, well, that's because we need the car driving. It's, it's an important thing and it's an important part of what we do. Um, and I think there's a bunch of stuff that's actually extremely positive about the future that we can shape with AI and how do we get there across all these fronts. So I, what I tend to look at safety as is uh, like, okay, uh, like for example, uh, cybersecurity with AI. It's like, oh, a worm gets released that takes the grid down. Well, that would be really bad, right? Like, um, and so you kind of go, okay, what are the things that have societal level impact of, lots and lots of people. Then you say, okay, well, 
what if you're um, you know, institutionalizing racism in parole decisioning? It was like, well, that would be bad. But by the way, one of the benefits of AI is we can study it, we can improve it, and we can, we can actually, in fact, drive it out in a way that we can't drive it out of the system today as easily, <laughs> right? And so getting on that path and figuring that out is actually, in fact, really good because we should be driving out racism out of parole decisioning, penalty, you know, what the sentencing is and other kinds of things, because, you know, that's, it's shameful uh, to have that, that sort of thing. So like as, a, as another example, but that's like a, you know, get out there, be learning and doing it, but do be asking these questions and do be fixing it and do be figuring out how to monitor it and do have kind of like, you know, part of what AI folks should be doing is saying, look, we heard these questions and here's what we're doing on them. Here's where we are today. Here's what we're like, uh, and we're planning on, on being better here. Because that's where the dialogue should be versus we're perfect. Like we, um, like for example, anyone can can more or less figure out how to get uh, a large language model to say something stupid because you say, okay, uh, please pretend you're a Nazi. Now answer this question. And you're like, okay, well, it's pretending you're a Nazi. If you go to search today, you can find this stuff too. It's like the bar is not, is it nearly perfect? The bar is like, what happens when you just type in and say, well, what's the history of Judaism? And if it gives you Nazi crap back, that's a problem, <laughs> right? But if you say, what's the history of Judaism? And it gives you like a really interesting, thoughtful equivalent of scholarly work and so forth. And what the, 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 the thing, that's great, right? And that's the kind of thing he's doing. So, so you have to index, how is it that we are moving with uh, all due speed towards creating the good futures how do we make sure none of the catastrophic impacts happen? How do we make sure then the other impacts, they're minor and improving and fixing? That's what we should be doing. And too often, most of the people who describe themselves as AI safety people are like, well, I'm here to, to stop you from releasing. And you're like, well, but you can't learn. You can't engage. You can't learn. It's like, that's not it. It's like, how do we make the right release? And how do we make the release not so it's perfect, but so, so where it's not catastrophic, like has no real bad bads, and, you know, is learning and improving and ultimately can get to a better place than we are at society today. One of the things that was very striking to me um, during COVID, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, is the degree to which scientific discourse was suppressed or censored on the major social platforms. And, you know, if you look at the platforms that are building um, the main foundation models now, to your point, they may end up being overlapping in terms of the people who own the social, pop, the social products. How should we think about political bias and models, scientific bias and models, or the lack of scientific accuracy? Because a lot of the training is going to be done by people, and people ultimately are going to have their own viewpoints on this stuff. So how, how do we think about that, or how do we approach that? Well, I think it's a really important thing. Look, we have some kind of unfortunate uh, various forms of erosion and politicization of science uh, from both the left and the right. Um, and I think we should resist both because I think we should try to say, that, look, um, part of the thing is how do you get to uh, truth? And truth is sometimes difficult. Truth is, is, I'm not a believer that truth is something that only like, you know, only white men can speak about truth for white men. I'm not a believer in that. I think uh, lots of people can speak about truth there. I think you have to be more careful about it. Um, because like you said, if I, if I were to say, well, I understand deeply what the experience of being, you know, uh, a, a person of color in modern American society is be like, okay, well, you're just saying you're an idiot. Um, you know, and it's like, no, no, but I try to learn. I ask questions and, and I can, I can say, look, I think there's a horrible problem in the criminal justice system. And I will comment on that. <laughs> right. And so you, you, you want to go to what are, what are the ways that we can be getting to truth? and being cautious about it and careful about it, but that's what's made all the scientific progress. That's what's made a lot of the technical progress. Um, and how do we keep the discourse at that level, even as we understand, like some things might be, um, uh, might be, you know, complex. So for example, you say, well, you know, is IQ a good measure of intelligence or not? Well, it's at least a measure. I'm not saying it's a good measure or even the best measure. And is it, you know, kind of the questions of, might there be some correlations between some genetics and intelligence? Like, probably. Now, if you start saying, well, but now we know it's this gene, you're like, okay, let's not be an idiot, <laughs> right? And let's not politicize it. Let's try to figure out how to understand it so that we 
we try to make a society that's better for all of humanity in terms of doing it. And so I think it's super important when you're getting to these, because, you know, you, you, you get in search models, like, you know, like search engines, like how is that reflecting scientific truth? I think you're going to want large language models and other kinds of scale compute. You're going to want it to have auditable in various ways. You're going to have the auditability um, available in a way that we can have discourse about, you know, is it doing the right thing? Um, and hopefully that discourse will be truth seeking. The other thing that people talk about a little bit from almost like a safety style consideration, although it's a little bit different, or a societal consideration, is job displacement. And I remember, um, I don't know if it was six, seven, eight years ago, I used to be invited to these forums because a lot of people were investing in self-driving car and self-driving truck companies. And there's this meme of um, AI was going to displace all the truck drivers by now, right? Roughly this time frame. And I remember there would be like senators who'd come and pull Silicon Valley and what should we do about all the truck drivers who are about to be displaced? And none of that happened, right? It's it's take it, it's self-driving has been a much harder problem than we thought. Um, where do you think is the biggest risk of job displacement and what's that time horizon? Is that five years away, 20 years away? Well, I think McKinsey did a pretty good analysis. And one of the mistakes is going, this job gets displaced, this job doesn't. What happens is the tasks and the capabilities and the tools in each job change and some change a lot and some change some. And that's a little bit of the point of saying kind of the co-pilot thing. So um, I think there's a whole bunch of jobs and it's not, isn't just like the care jobs, like doctors and nurses and teachers and so forth, but there's a whole bunch of jobs that we have nearly infinite demand for at a certain price point. Um, I think engineering is like that. I think graphic design is like that, you know, or design generally, you know, um, you know, both my parents are lawyers. So I'm allowed to say this. I regret that. I think lawyers are part of, are, are in that. <laughs> right. And so, um, uh, and so I think that there's a whole bunch of stuff there. And I think that even though we have the amplification, even though we have the job transferal, um, I, uh, the job, the changing uh, stats of the job, maybe, by the way, you know, your former million dollar a year job is now in today's dollars, $200,000 a year job or $150,000 a year job. But, you know, fine. Those are not, you know, those, those are high class problems. And we've had some of that with, you know, 30 years ago, doctor's jobs were, were much more uh, economically beneficial than they are today. They're still not bad relative to overall, but they're, but they're not as comparison to other things. And obviously we'd all like doctors to be paid a little bit more and maybe they could be amplified. And so, um, so I, I tend to think that it tends to be overstated. Now, that being said, it doesn't mean that there's zero. Like I think ultimately we will want uh, to get rid of the 40,000 deaths and, and have climate change impacts and have efficiency and redesign the city. I think we want to have autonomous vehicles. It's one of the reasons why, like I've invested in Aurora and invested in, um, uh, you know, a variety of other uh, companies in this. And, um, and so, you know, I think that that, that, that will happen, but that, but I think the question is, is say, well, then the question becomes, how do we transition well? Right. Um, and that doesn't mean that it isn't painful. There aren't people that we need to be focused on. But like for specifically, I'm like, like job, like right now we have a huge shortage of trucker drivers. Like it's almost like, like isn't isn't the question the question isn't are the like with trucks and with like human like like nursing care and so forth. The question may not be, oh my God, are the robots coming for the jobs? The question may be, oh my God, can the robots get here soon enough? Yeah, I always thought that was very ironic because if you looked at the average age of a truck driver, even back then it was in the mid fifties or high fifties and a lot of people were retiring and you basically saw the participation in that market dropping. And some people would talk about all that displacement. You're like, well, that's good, you know, because we don't have enough drivers right now. And it seems to your point, that's true in medicine and a few other areas. Um, look at the areas you're most excited about to invest in in this area. I mean, again, you're, you've been a legendary investor between Facebook, Airbnb, a variety of other companies. You've invested in AI for you know, a, a long time now. You're, you're sort of one of the first in it. Um, what are you excited about now? And are there specific startup ideas you're looking for? So, um, so by the way, all of the major co-pilot areas, very interesting. Um, and you know, I tend to think that it's, do you have... You know, part of the thing is um, too often technologists kind of go, well, it's just like I have a really cool new technological idea. You really have to blend it. Not, you know, typical kind of iBanker VC advice is a business model. I'm interested in business models. You have a great one. I'm very interested. But um, go to market. Um, what's your differentiation? How, do you, how are you going to establish an ecosystem of what you're doing? Uh, you know, is it going to have network effects or is it going to have something where you have a compounding loop that when you succeed at the hard test and the hypothesis of what you're doing, you'll suddenly be on a roll that you could potentially create something 
that's industry transforming, that, that's like, you know, kind of brings what you're doing for customers in the ecosystem to an entirely new level. Um, you know, and that's part of the reason why, you know, an additional inflection, Adept, you know, we've also done Cresta and Snorkel and a bunch of other things as, as part of this. And it's part of the reason why, like, I'm, um, uh, you know, I literally, uh, I'm now responding to emails because I think this will be true for a number of months saying, if it isn't genuinely interesting, you know, kind of scale compute and call it AI, right now I don't have time for it. Right, I only have time for, and it doesn't mean that I have to be doing your own uh, large language model because I think there are some very interesting things that are beginning to happen on uh, OpenAI and others. Um, but it's a question of, do you have an interesting conception of what your product and service is and kind of where you're going with it? And this is all looking through a, through a fog at night. Um, like it, Like move fast, figure it out, adjust. Uh, do you have the capabilities for that is also very important. Yeah, one of the big questions that I get from founders who are building in this area is the degree to which you know a wrapper on OpenAI is interesting, or the degree to which you you need to build your own model. And so, how important do you think that is? So it depends. I think a little bit of it is to depend on um, what is the component as you're building the business. So, if you think that the providers of the models won't be providing a model that helps you because of their own thing, then you have to build your own model. That's an obvious one. Another one is, okay, are the, if I'm going to be using uh, either a large or another model, um, do I have a dependency where that dependency will be a rug pull or, or something for me? And will they likely do that? Now, for example, uh, Will they be building larger models that have greater language capabilities? Yes, you should plan on that, right? Like, because they have a natural vector. They're not going to stop at, you know, GPD-3 and say, oh, we're done, <laughs> right? Uh, so you should be planning on that and you should, you should build your business and kind of strategy around that. But I think you can still use um, the APIs for that. And, um, and then the question is to say, well, if you're going to um, do your own, uh, one of the mistakes that's usually around technology, even with open source, is you kind of build it once you stop. Every piece of technology, you're constantly reinvesting in. So is it the thing that you, like for your market, for your product, for your company, is, the, is that one of the things that you should be reinvesting in? We don't all build our own you know, web servers. You know, we use a variety of open source stuff because it's like, no, that's not where you should be invested. Ultimately, we have a similar question. Now, right now, because we're looking through a fog at night, you know, running over uneven ground, there will be a temptation to build your own models and sometimes that temptation will be right. So it's kind of a question and that's part of the reason why the demand for open source and iterating on open source will be there. Um, and so, you know, uh, there's an answer that is clear as mud. Um, I, I guess uh, when I bucket the world of AI right now, I very unfairly kind of bucket it as like image gen and like diffusion models, the large language models and then kind of everything else. And everything else obviously is a very like mix of, of multiple markets, multiple technologies. There's everything from protein folding, which has largely moved to transformer-based models on through to like robotics and manipulating atoms in the real world. When do you think that latter piece will happen? So um, part of the thing, one of the reasons why I've done very little robotics um, other than like, you know, neuro and it's also part of self-driving, um, is because when the benefit of being in pure software and like, for example, being co-pilot to professionals is the software in the bits world is a lot easier than the atoms world. And even as you blend the two, when you blend in the atoms, it gets a lot harder on a lot of dimensions. It's, it's, it's not just harder in one additional thing. It's harder in lots of things that many more easy ways to break. So for example, the, um, they be embarrassed by your first product release, generally good for software, generally good for internet software, generally not so good for hardware, right? Like, you know, um, and so, you know, kind of as a spectrum. And so um, I think that the atoms part of it will start fitting in, in, um, uh, you know, kind of in, in areas with constrained circumstances. Like, for example, one of the reasons why, you know, I'm a, I, uh, a believer and a fan of the autonomous vehicle side is because you go, well, there's various places where this is a very actually a constrained space. 
um, obviously manufacturing robots will be a constrained space. Like, like where are the constrained spaces? Because, uh, you know, getting it to the unconstrained space adds a huge, like it will be solved, but a huge amount of difficulty. And part of the thing about being an entrepreneur is what's the simplest problem I can solve that's hugely valuable, right? It's not, oh, I'm going to be a gold medalist at solving this super hard problem because by the way, that occasionally happens and, and, and we can all go, oh my God, that's really amazing. SpaceX, really amazing. But lots of ways to die getting there. And you want to actually, in fact, like build. So it's the simplest problem that's really valuable. And that's the reason why it's like, well, it's, it's for me, it's I'm very careful when I move off kind of software. I'm like, what's the way that you're constraining the problem within the physical bits? Now, the other thing I would say is, um, I, um, you know, okay, I already made my disclaimer about predictions are a great way to look foolish in the future. Um, but the, uh, you know, I think that nearly for certain within the next three years, we will have another mechanism. I may still be heavily driven by transformers and all of the uh, instrumentation that's being built around that. But I really think the real driver is scale compute. And I think we will see other mechanisms that will really do the scale compute. And I gestured at the self-play games as an instance of one that has been there. And I think we will see those also coming. And do you think that's just gonna be evolutionary systems against some utility function or something else? Well, the macro view of it is how do you have a, a performance fitness function that you perform it, call it one exaflop. When you perform it at two exaflops, what does the performance function look like? And is it sufficiently better and can you, make, and then you go, okay, well, how about two? How about five? How about, you know, like, I think that's the, the way. And then what are the mechanisms that do that? Are there other areas of AI research that you're most excited about right now? Um, well, I've been uh, paying attention to um, some versions of, of Bayesian and other kinds of probabilistic programming, because I think it might have something uh, there. Um, I've been, you know, kind of paying attention to uh, you know, I think one of the things that's interesting is the loop with the creation of synthetic data. You know, I think that's interesting. So there's, I mean, I, I'm picking almost random examples out because there's like, like, like what a time, right? Like, like this stuff can be, we can create magic and there's just a ton of really interesting stuff going on. What's the direction that if AI became a hundred X more performant, you'd be disappointed in sort of the outcome of the world? Well, um, one of the things, so um, technologists generally feel that a lot of technology tends to be, call it uh, non-centralizing, you know, decentralizing. And actually, in fact, most technology tends to have centralizing uh, elements. So like, you know, you create the internet with a decentralized protocol, and then there's a set of companies that become the central anchors around that. And then, you know, nation states have certain things. And I think almost all technology, I think even cryptocurrencies as they, as they will get um, uh, more uh, kind of central, like more centrally adopted, like it's supposed to be fringe thing, actually we'll find that there will be lacunas of centralization, even if your protocol is totally decentralized and, and all the rest, because there's, there's reasons why human beings gathered in cities and, 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 and created, okay, well, you're the blacksmith and you're the soldier and you're the, you know, da, da, da. and it's a similar kind of centralization and technology enables that. And so it isn't that we can fight the fact that AI will have some centralizing elements. It'll be what are those centralizing elements and how do they do it? So for example, uh, democratic Western societies have centralized power and functions, have police forces, have militaries, but they're accountable to the people in various ways. So it would be like, that's what you want for the kind of the, the new kind of power things. And there's various ways to do that. And by the way, it's not having, you know, the government go build AI that like, Good luck. I mean, you know, if it could do it well, great. But like, you know, uh, the, the the when you look at moonshots from government-driven projects, they're almost always an adjunct to some kind of war effort, right? And um, I mean, that's a little too broad. But 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 like the major ones, <laughs> right? Uh, Apollo, Cold War, right? Um, and so uh, and so the question is, and you know, look where the space industry went after that arc down and, and required revitalization. And so, um, and so my disappointment would be is that it wasn't playing that kind of elevation of humanity 
side. Like you could imagine, like there's a lot of ways you could use, like, for example, when people are saying, well, okay, all these social networks and you can have these rebellions. It's like, well, but also the governments can study them and, and go and oppress specific individuals that they see in the pictures that are being done that. Well, I want it to be used in the, in the pro-humanity way and not the anti-humanity way. And that's one of the reasons why I'm such a strong advocate of that we need to be building these technologies that reflect the kind of values that we hold dear and not slowing down to have them built in other places, which may have values that we would have some challenges with. Yeah, if, if you extrapolate some of these intelligence curves in terms of what's coming over the coming decade or two, um, when do you think AGI will happen? Or do you think it will happen? Well, I think it's almost certain that AGI will happen um, at some level, but, um, but like, for example, right now, I look at this work with a scale compute as a progression of savants and more and more amazing savants. Now you could say thesis is that actually that progression of savants gets you to AGI, right? That's, that's a credible intelligent thesis. Um, but also it's a thesis, not a, not a, not a, uh, not a QED logical proof. Um, and I think these savants, and that's part of the reason why the human amplification and the human in the loop and all that, that's what I see in the visible future. That's why I wrote the Dolly essay uh, the way that I did, uh, you know, back in June, July, whenever that was. And, um, and so uh, now with uh, AGI, uh, you know, we ourselves are physical entities. Um, there's all kinds of questions around how biological intelligence evolves, all kind of question about how, you know, uh, uh, biological intelligence together with, you know, various kind of uh, silicon intelligence, you know, whether it's Neuralink or other kinds of things, how those work. And there's all kinds of questions about how the AI stuff will work. There's no reason to think that AI cannot be fully general, like a silicon intelligence can't be as fully general intelligent as, as a biological intelligence. Now, then the question comes to, okay, well, like the brass tacks is, you know, do you see line of sight right now? And the answer is low probability, right? Um, the, what do you think is missing? Well, um, I tend to think with due respect to all the people who think that this progression is on route, um, I tend to think that we have a kind of a generalist flexibility that I just haven't seen in these systems yet. Is it just scale that gets it to it? That's why I kind of said savant progression, because that's kind of the difference of a savant and a generalist in a human being is, is that kind of flexibility. It's like, oh, Elad's so much better than me at chess. How am I going to beat him at the chess game? Well, what I do is I, uh, I, I put some really good wine on the table and I hope he gets drunk, <laughs> you know? I hope so too. Yes, yeah, but you know, like, like you know, like, but this kind of, this kind of, like we are, we change the game when we go, oh, we can't win that game. We try to change this. And that's what the flexibility, the kind of non-savantness is. Because we've had savant human beings before. We've had human beings who are incredible at math and sciences or, and then can't really navigate their way around a street. I mean, it, that, that, that's kind of thing. And so the question is, on that general side, I tend to think in the current systems, I still haven't seen it. Now, maybe that's because I'm not one of the geniuses who's going through the iterations, but... But even with the increase, part of the reason I leaned all the way into this is even with, if you said all we have is a progression of savants, we are going to have magic, right? We already have magic and it's going to be really, can be, can be stunningly good for industries and society and humanity. Um, I think at this point, we'll open up the questions of the audience. So we'll probably take about three questions. And then as mentioned, unfortunately, Reed has an engagement right after this, so we'll have to take off. But everybody should feel free to stick around. So maybe we can take three questions from the audience. So I will also repeat the question because I suspect people in the back are going to hurt. So the question was roughly co-pilot for different businesses. Um, say someone's thinking about a co-pilot for business X, what would be the advice? So you have to kind of study what the dynamics of the business are. So one of the key, one of the things I think is going to be still broadly true of most AI things is one of the things that I'm, um, you know, started kind of, you know, preaching in oh, 20 years ago, I'm old. Um, and um, which is co-invent your go-to-market with your product, 
don't build your product and then say, okay, now I'm going to go to market. It's like, okay, what's the, what's the combination of the go to market with the product? Now, in consumer internet days, that was frequently virality or SEO or something like that. Fine, but be, be doing that as part of what you're doing. And maybe it's just sales. Um, but, you know, part of what I think is interesting, even in the transformation of the enterprise, is kind of the ways that even enterprise models with Slack or other kinds of things are changing the nature of how, how uh, sales models work. And so be thinking about that and what you're doing as well. And then be thinking, um, I, don't, I wouldn't overly sweat like TAM and so forth. TAM frequently looks small now, gets bigger, larger. Later, Uber is kind of the canonical current example of that. It's like, oh, it's just black cars. And it's like, no, no, it's a redefinition of the transport network. Okay, more, much more interesting. And so, um, and so don't overly sweat that, but do be thinking about like, okay, and then what does that adoption speed and curve look like? You'd want as part of the go-to-market, look at something that would, 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 would kind of have a, a fast adoption curve. Um, you'd want to have something that has some naturally, if you've taken all the risk and done all the innovation, you have some uh, natural moats in the business. Um, you know, network effects is, is, has been, you know, uh, bandied about. Most people say it and don't really fully understand what it is because there are networks without network effects to really look into that. But, um, uh, but you know, that kind of thing. So those, those are the kinds of attributes you'd be looking at. It's, it's a little bit kind of like, don't forget some of the key lessons from, from the consumer internet startups and the even the modern enterprise startups of the last couple of decades. Next question. Um, do you want to go ahead? Um, Mike? Uh, sure. yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, generative AI has clearly captured the attention of early adopter crowd and kind of building on the GTM piece. Um, what what kind of excitement is it eliciting in like enterprise or business buyers today? Like what, if we're thinking about a sales motion B2B, um, what are those things that are really resonating in, in that audience based on the conversations that you may have had with leaders of businesses and whatnot? Uh, well, uh, the business leaders read all the same news and, and hear about ChatGPT that all of us do. Um, and so I've been getting tons of questions and, you know, um, you know, they're looking for, they don't want to be left behind. They understand that, you know, part of how your business dies is you miss the new wave of the market, whether it's the technological underpinnings, the way you engage with customers, um, whether it's marketing sales, customer service, whatever else, um, what your supply chain looks like, how that all works. So they're, they're like, okay, we get it. It's a new wave. Um, now they tend to be, uh, you know, kind of like, okay, well, when, they tend to want to either know that they should really flip over and invest or they, they're not as good at experimenting, right? So that's part of the thing. And that's part of the reason why things end up, but they're, but they're, you know, I mean, literally I was uh, on the phone earlier with all of the leadership of Ford Motor Company because they're kind of thinking about like, what are the uh, transformations, you know, on, on, on uh, WebEx and they're asking these questions, right? And, and they understand that when they think about like, for example, chat GPT, they don't just think about like, okay, well, how does that affect how our, our, our company works, but also like, well, what would the engagement with a car look like? And should we think about that? And those were some of the kinds of questions that would be coming out. So, so um, I would say that everybody is super curious and looking at it. And there's, again, looking through the fog, you know, at night, they're kind of like, oh gosh, okay. I can't do everything. I can't, I can only do a few things. What should I be doing? That's the dilemma that you're in and that go to market and you have to navigate. You have to, that's part of like, like, like the amplifying the answer to the earlier question is like part of it is choose an area. Like if you're doing a co-pilot one, choose an area that you think you will get good adoption that people won't just go, ah, uh, and, and be very slow because that, even if you have an awesome product and the right transformation in the industry, that could still kill you. You've been through two big transformations before, or at least two, right? There's the first wave of the internet and maybe even the first two waves of the internet in some sense, and then mobile. How does this compare in your mind to the interest in those areas versus today by these larger enterprises? Uh, at least as big. And the thing that's interesting about this is when you get like, there's a natural kind of hype cycle. Say, this one will be the biggest one, it's bigger. And by the way, it might be true, but it might be true for a relatively banal reason, which is it's building upon the internet and mobile and cloud and so forth. It's like, okay, 
So it's the biggest, but it's the same reason the biggest where, you know, minus the pandemic, you know, each new year, there's a new box office record for movies. It's like, well, more people are watching movies and going to movies. So you have a new record. It's not necessarily that big of a deal. Uh, but I think it probably is biggest, but because it builds on all those and those continue. We have time for a few more questions. Maybe we go to the back for a question or two. Like, yeah, um, a lot of the best data sets for like fine tuning models or working on top of them are private rather than public. I'm curious what you think the runway is for parameters in publicly available data sets. And then kind of in the vein of if you're a Ford, Ford Motor Company and you have this massive data set that has a lot of applications, how do you think about partnering with people to, to use that? So obviously we have a bunch of things as a society to work out around data where I think most of the general discourse around this is somewhat broken because it's like, well, who owns the data? And it's like, okay, it's really complicated. Like one of you takes a picture of me on the stage. Well, do you own the picture? Do I own the picture? Does Notion own the picture? Does, you know, Eli's little event thing on the picture? I mean, so it's a complicated thing. And, and the ownership stuff is, it's much more of uh, what positive things could be done and what negative things should be prevented right, as, as, as part of this. And so there's a whole set of things on that. But um, I do think that, uh, you know, uh, in various interesting ways, uh, and this has been said, I'm, it's not original to me, data is a new form of oil. And I think that oil would be important. And I think that uh, organizations will realize that they have a bunch of oil, um, that uh, they both need to maintain the trust because like one of the things that the problem I have to resolve is absolute trust. And I think part of that's because if you're using data that comes from some, call it constituency, are you delivering some value for that data? People get a lot calmer when it's like, oh, you're giving me something for it, right? Like I get something for it. I, I, I'm not really buying into the like, you know, there should be a data commons where everyone's getting like a, a tenth of a penny or whatever, whenever, because I think that's just too hard to do. But because by the way, part of the whole thing about like social networks and, and, and a lot of games is actually, in fact, giving me some joy is much more worth it than the penny that you might give me, right, as part of how, you, how you're doing. So, you know, that trade of we give you some services and you give us data is a very good trade. So, I think it's how do you do the trust maintenance with it? And then how do you be giving something valuable as part of that trust maintenance back and solving that problem as part of what you're doing? And I think that's part of the reason why we're going to, like, I think of the world as we go forward to be like, not only like, here's how we're using the data and here's how we're using the data to try to benefit the constituencies who are uh, participating and generating the data and everything else. And this is why it, it works that way. And there's some, some um, uh, part of that. And I think that's, will be part of what will be na necessary to navigate uh, the modern world of using this data. I mean, this is obviously a very 50,000 foot principle and there are weeks and weeks of things to say about this, but anyway. Yeah, one framework that I think is kind of helpful for that too, is if you have a two by two matrix, of cost of generating the data versus scale of data, you actually can start identifying pockets that are either interesting at a certain scale and valuable, but not very costly and vice versa. So you can actually kind of segment the world that way and think about data in a deeper way, because I feel like it's not all one thing. And people often conflate it and people often think there's data modes when there aren't. And so I think like you kind of have to ask how expensive would it be to generate this data set from scratch and how valuable is it to use it? And then actually drive how you think about your business model or what to build. And one of the things that, uh, to gesture to an earlier thing when you asked my research, it's one of the reasons why I actually think the whole field of synthetic data generation will be actually super interesting. Yeah, applied intuition is right here in the front. So, yeah. <laughs> um, the person in the back. That's just because Kassar was sitting here in the back. Yeah, yeah, I had nothing to do with, with them. Um, uh, in the back, in the middle there, please. So uh, regarding AI safety, we obviously need a point between too safe and not safe enough. And right now in the debate, major players are commercial AI companies with, which benefit from keeping models uh, closed. So do you think that might cause this point to be unfairly too closed? Well, um, one of the benefits of the fact there'll be a whole bunch of competition um, you know, and, and an oligopoly does have really real competition, um, uh, is that I think that the kind of market will 
will to some degree sort that out, although I may even sort that out to being a little bit too unsafe, um, maybe. Um, you know, I do think that the question around, you know, it's a natural conflation to say, well, it's great for, for my business to keep it closed and I'm gonna claim safety. And of course, you know, you have to pay attention to both of those. It's not necessarily an evil thing to say, look, it's great for my business to keep this closed too, because I'm reinvesting in what I'm doing and all the rest. It's kind of say, well, my business has moats and I'm getting, you know, some good margins for that. I'm reinvesting and creating something that's really valuable. That's actually good for society. Um, and so um, I think the real question where I've become to get much more active is when you are saying, well, you're actually really making uh, startups much more difficult. Um, and that was part of the reason why I was saying, well, I think there's actually, even with, if it's through APIs, which have increased safety coefficient and a bunch of other things, uh, I think there'll be room for a lot of startups and that will be fine. Um, so I'm, I'm not, this, this area doesn't bother me yet. Um, I'm not saying it couldn't bother me um, because if it's like, for example, huge generative, generativity because of the internet with the open systems, great. Mobile, much more challenging because you have uh, two, my, two, two major mobile OSs, both of which kind of quell certain kinds of innovation um, in a similar kind of thing. And so that bothers me because that does quell startups, whereas I don't think here it's doing that yet. And one last question, maybe from the front. Um, do you want to go? Uh, yeah, so you mentioned, um, you touched a little bit about robotics. Uh, I'm wondering, why do you think that we haven't seen mass adoption of consumer robotics? If it's a function of um, there not being one single very definable pain point or just a function of the fact that the cost is still too high? And uh, with this new wave of AI platform shift, do you see that changing? And if so, what is the catalyst? Um, so I think... Uh, the basic challenge is, is that it's a little bit like I was saying earlier between the bits and the atoms, which is when you get to atoms, it's a whole bunch more expensive. Not only do you have to do all the work to develop it, to make it super safe, you know, supply chain, you have inventory, you have a high burn rate that's, you know, per month that you have to clear and you have to clear reasonably. You have to have investors that believe that that can happen and it will have a sufficiently valuable thing that they should be putting money into this in terms of instead of a software thing. So all of that kind of conspires. And so nevertheless, of course, people have tried consumer robotics, but, and, you know, I tend to be one of those people who goes out and buys the new thing. Um, you know, each time it comes out like, Oh, you know, an Ibo, like I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll have a robotic dog, um, you know, and, and I tend to be one of those people, but it's kind of like the, okay, like played with it for a couple hours and then went, all right, that was cool. cool. I'm done. <laughs> right. Um, and so, uh, and so you have to get into something that's more than that. And it's, and it's, and it's hard. And I think just generally speaking, um, it was like one of the things that I told the, the, the Ford folks that I really respect about like what they and other folks in their industries done, like, you know, Ford's done a great job of anticipating climate and EV and doing all that stuff is a working with hardware too is, is frankly hard. And, and, and we want more of that. Like as, an in, as a society, we want more of this. And so we don't want capital just only flowing the software, um, but it's, it becomes much harder. And when the, the, the capital markets are free, they tend to go to crypto, right? Because they go, ooh, that's really easy. Not today, but really easy to make a bunch of money. And so you're like, okay, we need, we want, medical stuff. We want hardware stuff. We want this kind of stuff. And so we have to kind of push in that direction some, uh, but it's because it's a lot harder. Oh, well, um, if you could please join me in thanking Notion for hosting, Cynthia Gildia for all the hard work on this event, Reed for attending, and then all of you for coming. And um, feel free to hang out for another hour or so. Um, and then again, you'll be booted around to eight. And thanks everybody for coming. <laughs>